My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. Philip Grant Wilson was a giant of a man who wanted to be a giant in the underworld. He was smart, at two metres tall, he was physically imposing, ruthless, a leader of a ragtag army of like-minded lunatics and a firearms nut. What a combination. He was known as the Ice Man because they said he had ice water running in his veins. At the age of 34, he was the owner of a profitable engineering firm which he later sold in order to run a private hotel in Melbourne's CBD, where he recruited drug addicts to commit welfare frauds and armed robberies. The gang provided heroin to those on the fringes of the underworld, then demanded they pull stick-ups to pay the bill. According to a confidential police report, his team, quote, intended to embark on a campaign of crime which would make all members very rich by a young age. Some of the crimes they had already committed consisted of burglaries, armed robberies, car theft, criminal damage by the use of explosives and serious assaults on the victims of the armed robberies. And that was just the start. When the cops smashed the glass here, that was, that was Moorish. Detective Sergeant Moorish. I've got a bad memory for faces, but that guy I'll never forget in 100 years. His face is burned on my memory. The man who called himself the General thought with his military-like strategies he could invade the underworld. But he made many enemies along the way, some of them some serious crooks. And he sparked the interest of some pretty intense detectives, including the legendary John Morris. Remember, he was six foot eight inches tall, but as I ran through the door, he was standing there with a gun in his hand, so I, all I could do, I hit him between the eyes with a thirty-eight caliber revolver. I had a number of conversations with Wilson over the years. One was the night of March 27, 1986, just hours after the Russell Street bombing. Wilson had appeared in the Melbourne Magistrates Court that morning, and with his hatred of police and knowledge of explosives, many police were convinced he was the man. After the bombing, I wrote a story quoting Wilson protesting his innocence over the Russell Street bombing. Of course, he was right. He wasn't the bomber. I think he was impressed by that story because after that, we would talk sporadically. He seemed to want to persuade me that he was a good guy. I wanted to find out why he wasn't. I was dead set worried. Now, every time something goes wrong, we get blamed for it now. To go and write a front page headline, everyone who tried to believe it, someone's got a lot of credibility. And uh, and then there was the, of course, the Russell Street bombing, the first bomb goes off and uh, and then well, of course it was your story which did us a lot of good I think it was pretty uh, you got it first and spoke to me uh, but the age that was a really damaging story that. I mean I read that I shit myself so like, when he jarred me up and said you read the age you read the age and uh, virtually did it because he was famous you know relating you know, men involved back with the shooting of a, a right wing Nazi suspect in one turner in 1985 it was just virtually did everything but put my name down there. And the old man rang up and said, what's going on here? I've read the front page of the age. He tells me that he would never lie to me. But after all, he was a born liar. He may have taken his coffee with one sugar, but I took his story with a grain of salt. Sugar with a white and one sugar thing. I won't lie to you, right? But because uh, to some extent, I want to establish a rapport with you, so at least uh, you might go and print a firewall story, but I want you to believe what I'm saying. Now, look, I'll be as candid as possible. There's a few embarrassing things here and there that I won't bring up, but I won't lie to you. Over no, the last 12 months, with this committal proceeding against the police, well, let's say the last eight months, not the last eight months, um, No, I, I'm, uh, I'm up to my ears and something at the moment. Where are you? Right, 
This is part of the police report on Wilson's gang. They describe them as a paramilitary group that had armed themselves with a wide range of firearms, including machine guns, military rifles, pistols and revolvers, shotguns and high-powered sporting weapons. Quote, This group undertook intense physical fitness training for the purpose of establishing a physical and mental advantage over police, especially the Special Operations Group, against whom they fully expected to come up against at some time in the future. Police were told the leaders of the gang were Tom Messenger and Philip Grant Wilson. Quote, The information was that both men boasted that they would not be taken by police and would shoot it out to the end. The group owned a property in bush country at Beanack, where they undertook regular shooting practice with a full range of weapons they possessed. Police put the group under surveillance. They found them using a surveyor's theatre light as a front while they watched a series of factories as part of a plan to commit payroll arm robberies. The moderately successful engineer bought a down-market private hotel and began to recruit the down-and-out to commit those armed robberies. Gregory John Midap and Phil Wilson were business associates and criminal affiliates. What business is it are you in, Greg? Well, no business at all, really. Uh, our only real connection is Penel's private hotel, uh, having slogged my ass off for seven or eight years, uh, for 70 plus hours a week in engineering, and made a modest return on the money. I said, uh, I'll invest money with Greg. It's the only connection, business connection. All oh, right, it's Penel's. Yeah, Greg spotted the hotel. June of the uh, year before last. It was a private hotel, billboard, 35 uh, renovated rooms uh, up for lease. We paid 29 16 66 a month. They were both fairly short because they're doing renovations, uh, which was agreed upon. We were probably up another 800 bucks a month. But other than that, we just uh, rented out, pay them their, uh, their uh, rental per month, and, uh, pay uh, power and rates, and uh, the rest is out of the been quite a good among them. And that's my principle at the moment, uh, interest with Greg, even though there's nothing on paper, it's basically a one third, one third, one third, but uh, you know, uh, Greg's not really involved with the hotel at all, he's been off. I mean, you never know what Greg's doing, he'll wait for someone to go. Uh, at this present time, I really haven't got a business connection with Greg, though on the other hand, if he needs something done, needs to run around, needs a bank account open, needs something done here, gives me a phone call, I'll go and do it. The hotel, Purnell's private hotel, was set up with the help, advice and counsel of Midap. For years, Midap acted as a jailhouse lawyer and he also sometimes appeared to be some sort of drug counsellor for the down and out, when he was actually Wilson's right-hand man. The place I said to Greg, look, you give me a, a back scratch with, uh, with helping me with my legal side of things, I'll own you 10 grand. Well, I sold three quarters of my engineering business, I had about 45 grand at that stage, cash money. So I think I loaned Greg initially five grand, another three grand. Uh, over the rest of the year, I think I put about like 25, 30 grand in his pocket. Greg Midapp, also known as Helmut Kirsch, was a con artist who conspired with Olaf Dietrich to import heroin from Thailand. Midapp stayed in Melbourne while Dietrich went to Thailand to get the drugs. When Dietrich arrived at Melbourne Airport, he was searched thoroughly because Midapp had told his federal police contacts that Dietrich was carrying drugs. The officers found nothing. Dietrich had heroin all right, but it was inside him. He'd swallowed dozens of condoms filled with the drug. Midapp knew this, met him afterwards, and hid him away to let nature take its course. After recovering most, but not all, of the loaded condoms, Midapp again contacted police. This time he told a version of the truth, that the heroin was inside his mule. Midap ended up with a lion's share of the drugs and brownie points from his police contacts for informing on the trafficker. Dietrich was locked up, the remaining evidence rumbling in his belly. When it appeared, he mixed the drugs with excrement and smeared them over the cell walls in an attempt to disguise the analysis. It was a different sort of brownie point. Forensic police diligently gathered the evidence and proved the case. You can hear more of Olaf Dietrich, who later changed his name to Hugo Rich, 
in the episode The Snake and the Ladder Man. Greg Midup met Wilson at the yards of Pentridge Prison. Greg, who wasn't a qualified solicitor, was giving legal advice to Wilson in exchange for cash. They had a I scratch your back, you scratch my back deal. Well, I bumped into Greg for both my mind out at the same time at Pentridge, and then Greg still made a hand. Well, let's say give me advice at the same time. Um, you qualified solicitor or not? Be pardon? Is he qualified no, solicitor? I believe so. I believe he's a solicitor's manager mark at one stage. And also he's got a uh, got a uh, certificate in law, or CBS or something, whatever it is. Oh, hang on. Certificate of business studies in law. One of Rick's strongest you know, uh, attributes uh, comes from his ability to learn quickly, puts his mind to something in. I mean, you don't have to have a qualification in the law. I've met half a dozen solicitors in the last 12 months in my unfortunate dealing with the police that really don't impress me. They're incompetent, they're not sharp, they're not motivated, they're not skilled in my opinion. Uh, whereas on the other hand, Greg's the opposite. You've got to bear in mind with Greg, he's a very proud man and uh, very high intellect. I think he had his intellect done and his IQ done when he was 20, 155. And uh, he's got a very strong ability to concentrate and read a technical book and uh, absorb a lot of information in a very short amount of time and then sound like an expert. So he's got to absorb quickly. But nevertheless, you know, he's always done the right thing by me and I regard him as one of my few friends, a most unusual one, which is normally one of my male type friends, but you know, I regard him as a friend. And, uh, and uh, also, uh, we got into a business called At Medco, which uh, was uh, another one of Greg's schemes. Greg's got that many connections, it's unbelievable. Uh, and I'm not sitting here blindly uh, uh, regurgitating what he's told me. I've seen over the years what he's capable of doing. He's very well connected, hated a lot by a lot of people. He's shafted a lot of people. He's, he's just been actively involved in a lot of wheeling and dealing. He's got a lot of people that owe him favours. Now, I figured, fuck it, I'll invest 10 to bring ground with him and see what he can do. At Pennell's Hotel, Wilson planned the jobs, recruited the team, selected his targets, organised the cars, guns and disguises. He also facilitated the laundering of the money, often through the hotel itself. Naturally, the hotel became the target of a number of police raids. That's the one the cops have raided uh, twice now. Brian Murphy and Co came down in uh, about mid-October last year and went through the place searching for stolen TVs. Police were convinced Midup was selling heroin at the hotel. They found a truckload of gear there, but not the heroin. And we've had numerous phone calls to B11. We've been trying to get our property back. I'll show you a list of the stuff that was taken from the hotel. That's... We had 26 high quality porno movies taken, 100 litre long jar, he's a bit of a connoisseur, 100 bloody high quality gloss magazines, 11 bottles of bloody Dom Perrier 1975 champagne, 200 bucks a bottle, cigars taken, uh, a giant black dildo, you name it, it's just like a, a supermarket trip. Not to mention a lot of valuable uh, documents that put us out of business. We really we've suffered a lot since the Pinal's raid. We just haven't got, ever got our shit together again. In late January 1985, Pinal's hotel was again the target of another police raid. The building still exists, but the hotel is long gone. It was located at what was then the slightly shabby part of Melbourne, Elizabeth Street, near the Queen Vic Market. At the time, Wilson drew me a diagram and recounts what happened that day. You were bottom floor near those doors. That's correct. Where you were the building, the actual assault took place in that front office that's technically 445, which is, if you go on the door, the office is to the left. We'll give you a diagram for one. It's changed. There's been a lot of renovations done. Yeah. Elizabeth Street here, right, Flinders Street Station down there. You know, there's an alleyway up there, remember that? Yeah. There's now a door here, big plate glass window there. And uh, back when you were, might have seen it, there was a door there with a corridor leading down here, yeah, that's right. and a vending machine here, I think, from memory. And there was a back portion here, uh, alleyway there, and there was a little door adjoining here. 
I was sitting in a chair here. I was reading the Sun newspaper. I just got back from seeing my parents' place, and that was the day that the Challenger space shuttle had just blown up. January 29, 85. 7.35, and I was sitting there glancing through the sun. I just arrived back from my parents' place in Fenty Gully, and I heard a smash, crash, bang, and I thought, fuck, what's going on here? Someone's tossed a brick through the window. I got up, walked through this door here, walked to about here, and bear in mind, back in those days, there were desks, and the desk there, desk there, desk there, petition there, pot plants. It was a really nice, nicely laid out office. Big filing cabinet about here. There might have been a petition there. Big table here. Uh, and it was nicely laid out, painted. It was, you know, we spent a lot of money and time getting it set up. I walked about here, looked across there to that window there, and saw the glass had been smashed in. And uh, the guy had his arm through the door, it was open the door. And the door was open now, so I started with it. He smashed the glass and then walked through it. And I think I said, oh, fuck, here we go again, having been raided once 12 months ago. And I said, I didn't exaggerate. My hands up, and I said, take it easy, I'm giving up, no worries, I think, something like that. But the first thing I said was, oh, Jesus, here we go again. I wrote it with hands like that, fingers spread, palms facing, because this guy was a really psyched up guy, kept a shotgun on me like that, and walking towards me. I thought, I'm not going to get blown off by some idiot cop that can't bloody manage his weapon. <laughs> so I just stood there and walked forward towards the guy, I said, take it easy, no worries, nothing in my hands words to that effect and uh, he walked up to me and then just reversed the shotgun like someone cracked in the face and that's Who what was that? that was Moorish I was right here actually when the cops smashed the glass here that was that was Moorish Detective Sergeant Moorish I've got a bad memory for faces but that guy I'll never forget in 100 years his face is burned on the memory Wilson had a hatred for one policeman Johnny Morris. John was a legendary detective and a mentor to a generation of investigators. He was known in the job as the Pope because people who had a private audience with him invariably felt an overwhelming desire to confess. Sly of the Underworld. 17 after 8. Sly, good morning. Uh, Good morning, gentlemen. Um, There are very, very few legends left in policing these days and we've got one less with the news that... uh, Detective Senior Sergeant John Henry Morris, 15717, retired last week after 39 years in the job, um, as we've already discussed, known as the Pope because of people's overwhelming desire to confess when they're just in his presence. Former member of the armed robbery squad and the homicide squad. And uh, we're very lucky to have the Pope on the line with us. John, welcome. Morning, Sly. Morning, Ross. Morning, John. Nice Hi. to speak with you again, John. Yes, Ross. Couldn't be a better time because uh, we noticed that Helmut Kirsch has been making headlines. You would have known him as uh, Gregory Alfred Midap. You would have known him a fair time, John. I did. I opened their paper yesterday morning, the Herald Sun, and I saw this uh, man dressed up in a, a mufti uniform. I thought, I know that face. Anyway, <laughs> it was uh, Greg Midap. His good friend was uh, Philip Grant Wilson, and I remember that uh, Mr Wilson once told me that there was a raid on Purnell's Hotel and that you came through the door and hit him with the butt of the shotgun when he hit the ground, you put the uh, barrel in his mouth and said, you don't look so tall down there, big fellow. Now, would there be any truth in that, John? Remember, he was six foot eight inches tall, but as I ran through the door, he was standing there with a gun in his hand, so I, all I could do, I hit him between the eyes with a thirty-eight caliber revolver to sort of shake at him and put him down on the floor. So the shotgun wasn't there, it was a thirty-eight, definitely. Well, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, get your yes. facts straight, Sly. Um, right. Now, of course, and you wouldn't have said anything down there other than render him assistance, I would imagine. I, I think uh, there was some assistance rendered. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, but it didn't help him because... I'll... This is our last episode for this series. We'll be back in November for a summer series. What could be better than sitting on a beach listening to stories about psychopaths? Thanks for the reviews. We're overwhelmed, particularly the one that said it's great to listen in the bedroom. I think I'm blushing. Midup was up to his hairy armpits in multiple crimes and police wanted to bust him for drugs. For a smart man, Wilson decides to play dumb, saying he had no knowledge of such awful matters. 
Please forget that the tape recordings of Greg and Sue and Helmet all involved in drug and trafficking and what have you. Now, that could be, I doubt it. But basically, you've got to find these things out. Maybe he's the biggest drug pusher under the sun. I don't believe he is. Now, Greg, I've put up over the last. Who they told about the tape, tapes? Well, this is what the body cop uses evidence. Now, yeah, Greg's a uh, uh, bailout. He said, We have got tapes of information. Did they find them? Really? No. no. A few people. You said that they were looking at fit, fitting um, Greg with drugs, right? We've established that. Right. Guns. What was that? No, no guns. What they're setting up with this, uh, this gun, or what I heard of the, uh, his bailout, 200 grams of body pure heroin, cut four ways. I don't know a lot about junkies. I, I've never seen smack in my life. I know it's white powder and, uh, and it looks like glucose. That's all I know. I'm not interested. I've never been in that scene. I say, I've smoked at the grass here and there, but it does, does nothing for me, so I've got to start it up. I might have had bloody half a dozen joints in my life. Just to, I was just curious. The dope, or I should say, smack, I've never had any involvement in. Uh, I've got quite a callous attitude with that. If you're dumb enough, the body becomes an alcoholic. If you're dumb enough to become a junkie, you know, it's your personal business. And again, it's a, it's a weakness in a person's character. They need some sort of crutch. You know. So, in short, what's happening, as far as you can see, is that they may or may not be trying to fit you with murder. Yeah, I reckon. Certainly with drugs. Uh, well, well, there's Greg. no sign of drugs in there. Yeah, we well, certainly agree. The system is just talk. Two of Wilson's down and out recruits were Lena Galea and Ricky Parr. But Wilson turned on them when he concluded they'd cost him 150000 from a botched drug deal. He lured the two to a country property on the pretense of a picnic. Kalia, 30, was still recovering from a car accident and needed crutches to walk the short distance from where they parked, 65 kilometres from Melbourne, to where the picnic rug had been set up. As they sat there, Wilson walked up behind Ricky Parr and shot him in the head from behind. The terrified Galea hobbled on her crutches trying to escape. Wilson followed laughing and shot her from behind as she reached a fence. Their bodies have never been found. Ricky and Lena, a couple of people I know, jumped. I, just, no, I don't know them personally, but I've stayed at the hotel for a while. No, they have got no idea who they are, what they are, whatever. Greg knows them, uh, as far as I know, uh, very casually. But other than that, I don't know those people. Well, wouldn't know his last name, wouldn't know where he came from. He stayed in one of the rooms of the hotel for uh, uh, probably three months. Who are these people? The Rick, Rick. Yeah, oh, uh, Rick. Rick, Rick and Lena. Now I, know, now I know that Ricky's surname was Parr, and uh, Lena, I can't pronounce it, wouldn't like Ricky Parr or something. Ah, yeah, he disappeared, fuck up or whatever, I don't know. That's the sort of things they're, they're putting in the herd. The I don't know, this Ricky Parr. And Lena, somebody else. Yeah, Lena, apparently it's beautiful. That, they both said that that's from us. I don't know, I didn't see her very often. She was there for about a month or something. She had a car accident up in, in Mildura, came down in crutches, and she was there for about a month or so. Now, other than to say hello, how are you? Occasionally held the door open for her, but she hobbled through. Occasionally uh, opened the door so she could make a phone call. Other than that, didn't know from the bar or so. And the same with Ricky, although a bit, I knew Ricky a bit more. Said hello a couple of times. Ricky, he was a couple of cheap, I think he was a seller, I'd say. But again, only rumour. We can have nothing with Greg. Don't tell me about it. That's my well, opinion. It was Greg who thought that he was a I think he might have mentioned something. I, I was under the impression that he was some guy. Now, I can't say exactly where that idea. Well, out of the hotel or was that? I don't believe so. Uh, down on, on Fitzroy or something, Fitzroy Street or whatever. Uh, I think another reason might have been that I think he, he disappeared for a week or so. Where's Ricky? Oh, he's a piece of work. And, uh, apparently, selling dope or something like that. Bailed out and he come back to the hotel. Now, Lena, was she a seller or a junkie? No or? idea. No. Uh, just a little walk girl, that's the one I got from. You know, nice enough sort of thing, but I hardly ever spoke to her. No. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the cops are saying to Sue Telford, who I hardly know from the bar, 
Phil is knocked off by the Rick and Lena. Just this Rick and Lena. Why? That's why is that the only? No idea at all. But I, I don't know what's in the cops head. Like they, these guys just keep coming up with all these fancy ideas. I mean, you wrote a story, well, not you or someone, wrote that story on the 7th of February, uh, about a week after I was in hospital, about a plane plot to kill PC. Now, I don't know who you spoke to about your business, right? But someone's put the shit in your head. Plane plot to kill PC. I've got the, I've got the, the front page still in our files. You know? Dangerous gang with international connections, uh, access to body automatic weapons, radical political body leanings. Has, has recently bought an aircraft, a little body Piper body I picked up, which is a long sort of aircraft to put some out of. It's a low wing. You can use a Cessna, you can get a tech out there. Yeah, well, but, but that's what they're saying. They recently bought an aircraft. So you, you want a Cessna with a wing at the top of the Well, that's what parachute is or, or yeah. parachute or something. This, I shouldn't let them say things like that, but I'm saying it. It's just the whole story was ridiculous from end to end because it wasn't even technically viable. <coughs> but they said they'd recently bought an aircraft, they were plotting to kidnap a uh, police constable and, uh, and throw him out of the plane in a in, in revenge killing. Phil always thought big. On January 1, 1985, one of his allies, Tommy Messenger, was shot dead in one turner when he fired at members of the Special Operations Group. A tactical blunder, really. Wilson vowed revenge and planned to abduct one of the SAG officers, Bruce Knight, and throw him from a light plane. He denied it to me, but I've no doubt it was right. Wilson was a big man with big dreams. The trouble was, he was just a little bit mental. One of his dreams was to be a neo-Nazi cult hero. Wilson had an ongoing love affair for Nazi Germany and had his own alias, Kurt von Hessler. He fantasised about his own death and funeral where his coffin would be carried by an armoured personnel carrier in a state funeral. In a letter where he spelled out his fantasy, the Prime Minister says once in a lifetime someone comes along who is allowed to break the rules. Would God let him go to heaven? The PM is asked flippantly. No, he says to the lightweight reporter. His reply captured on national television. Only the likes of you end up in heaven. Heroes go to Valhalla. Wilson certainly thought of himself as pretty cool. If they sold tickets to himself, he would have bought one in the Grand Circle. I've got a pretty good personality. I've got nobody personality defects. I don't need to bash people to prove myself, things like that. I've not a bad sort of guy. And I've learned over the years uh, to you know, not have to impose myself on people. When I was 16, I was bouncing on pub, right? Now, believe it or not, you know, I mean, bouncers have got a bad name, right? A good name is a bouncer, and a lot of pubs over the years are someone that didn't used to drink on the job, had a groan in his head. I've got three or four pub owners that, you know, always want to fill Wilson on the job. And I've seen vindictive bouncer types that get off on hurting people. They take the blood side and bash them. You know, they're what I call personality defects. They've got to hurt people to make themselves feel superior or feel good. I've never had that sort of a requirement. I'm competitive in business, very aggressive. I don't have to hurt people. I never have. You use a minimal amount of violence because if you hurt someone in bouncing, you end up with a bloody civil suit and police coming out. So it was always, I've done, you know, judo and keto, so I'm not bad on finger locks and uh, arm locks and the side and everything. I've already seldom had to hit people in the head. I don't hate anyone. I've got mean, my father's nature. If I'm a pretty forgiving person, even the cunts have beat me up, right? Uh, I don't really hate them. I've got no physical hate before them. As far as I'm concerned, I've got contempt. The fuckwits, anyone that's dumb enough to beat someone up in public body view, is lacking in brain power. Yeah. But as far as being a human being goes, the one thing you can really be proud of is having a good brain in your head. You'll be ugly, stupid. Yeah. Uh, you know, cripple, whatever. You've got a head in your shoulders, you can basically be proud of yourself. If someone's dumb enough, or incompetent enough, or stupid enough, or whatever, to go and do something like that, you almost got to feel sorry for you know, this guy's a fuck, you can't do his job right. That's what you can have pride of, pride in. You can be a street sweeper, but you must always do your job properly and competently and have pride in yourself. Wilson wanted to be a star, 
but he wasn't prepared to learn his trade off Broadway. He was a novice, while most career crooks had been in the system for years. Many can hardly write their own names, but they survive on rat cunning and underworld connections. Wilson was bright, but proved to be a big man out of his depth. And a few nutter mates, who thought the Third Reich got a bad rap, were never going to cut it as a crime gang. Police say Wilson was a goose-stepping goose who was always going to be cooked by his own deluded ambitions. On August 4, 1987, the Iceman was shot dead in a cold-blooded ambush outside a South Yarra chiropractic clinic. The murder remains unsolved. As a matter of completeness, investigators made quiet inquiries about the whereabouts of Mr John Morrish on the night in question. Foul rumour and gossip actually had you as a suspect, but I imagine there would have been nothing in that. No, I was in the police club that night. They had a... Uh in the old police club, they had the big island bar, you know, everyone could see each other. That's where I was. I think I was there, and I, th- I think I would have given evidence that you were there, John. Um, I think you did. You were, well, I think you are on the list. But, but <laughs> you, you ultimately had to give evidence at that inquest, and, and extraordinary for an investigator like yourself. Um, I think you were actually cautioned. I was given a full caution, which for your, your listeners is a, uh, they, they uh, give you the criminal rights, you know, you don't have to answer questions, etc. So I was given a caution, and uh, I was... Uh, accused of having some complicity in the, his demise. So I sat there, uh, stood there in the witness box and thought for a moment, I thought, look, I, I uh, understand the uh, caution, but I deny the allegation. And that was the end of it. One of the most famous quotes in policing, I understand the caution, I deny the allegation. No. Tell me your theory about uh, the, the criminals. I suppose the expression criminal class comes into it. Are they people who are clever in the sense that they're cunning, but dumb in the sense that they've chosen a path that they're never really going to benefit from. Yeah, well, it's partly true. Uh, you see a lot of these drug dealers, really, they, uh, they have moments of high and wealth, but how many uh, make the distance? You know, they're either dead or they're in jail or they end up broke, so uh, uh, they're smart in one way but dumb in other ways, you know. Midap has a long criminal history and has been convicted over 70 times of serious offences, including accessory after the fact to the double murders of Lena Galea and Ricky Parr, heroin trafficking, attempting to pervert the course of justice and attempting to bribe a policeman. At one stage he ran a halfway house for ex-inmates, which is a bit like putting a fox in charge of the hen house. He was also an office holder for the ultra-right group National Action. I suppose you've got to get out sometimes. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom. So to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This is the last of the second series of Naked City because the production team has been taken away on another urgent project. Probably how to make a mung bean salad or an almond latte. Who says crime doesn't pay? Come back in November for the next season where we will be looking at, among other things, the Russell Street bombing and the fascinating Mark Brandon Chopper Reed. This episode was produced and edited by Anu Hasbolt and transcribed by Margaret Gordon. Mixed by Cormac Lally. Archive is thanks to 3AW. Head of audio is Tom McKendrick. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening.